We have um, three presenters uh, talking about their organizations. Uh, first, Nancy Lee Wood um, from Bristol Community College, and then Rachel Moriarty from Schumacher Center for New Economics, which is a legacy organization, and then Sherelle Gardner um, from Co-op Dayton. And then I'm going to speak a little bit about um, community solutions. So Nancy is a professor of sociology and director of the Institute for Sustainability and Post-Carbon Education at Bristol Community College. And I, if I could note that Nancy is the person that introduced me to community solutions. We drove out um, to Ohio from Massachusetts once and then once to Detroit um, to uh, go to the peak oil conferences. Uh, she is the former coordinator of the college's sustainability studies program, which she spearheaded. She's board president for the Cambridge-based organization Biodiversity for a Livable Climate and an advisor and former board member to the Arthur Morgan Institute for Community Solutions. And her most recent publication, Preparing Vocational Training for the Eco-Technical Transition, appears in Earth Ed, Rethinking Education on a Changing Planet, published by the World Watch Institute in Washington, DC. Nancy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. I'm going to share here because I have some slides. Thank you all very much. It's good to see you all. I assume everyone can see that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here um, talking about Arthur E. Morgan, um, who was a man truly, truly ahead of his time. He was a kind of Renaissance person. And uh, it's really quite astounding, I think, the, the breadth of uh, forward thinking that he was engaged in. When I was reading through some of the material about him, I began thinking about democracy because, of course, he sees democracy as the core of community. And he looked at democracy, I think, with both a big D and a small d. There was the big, larger scale governmental uh, possibilities outside of the community that would be the big D. But he really focused a lot of his work, most of his work, in fact, on the small d the democracy within a community and seeing it as being the core. Continuing with the small d, its essence, um, here are some thoughts I had that have come, come up in listening to people speak today and also having read material about Arthur Morgan. Um, at the core of democracy, and especially the small d, is freedom and autonomy Originality, an enormous amount of creativity, integrity is core, interdependence of, of people, justice, having a real sense of there being an, an importance of egalitarianism, uh, service and joyfulness. I think the fact that no one ever saw him dance, I bet he would, I bet he would try dancing at some point if he were invited to. <laughs> And it's amazing the number of things that he was involved in and thinking about community organizations, uh, the pioneers, uh, the design of community organization, leadership within uh, communities, developing councils and having fellowship within communities. These are all, these were all central to his thinking. And I am locked here, okay. Here we go. And then vital community interests, uh, thinking about government and public relations, um, community health systems, uh, community social services, ethics in communities, small community recreation sites, cooperatives as expression of community, uh, community economics, social and cultural aspects of community life, and the role of the church in the community. I mean, he really, he, he was a profound sociologist, actually. That's my field, sociology. And I look at his work and he was such a profound sociologist looking at all of these different aspects of community and social life. The reality is that he was a man ahead of his time. Um, and just at the time, he be I believe he died in 1975. 
And it was just around this time that we began to see the emergence of an ecological consciousness. So in 1962, we see Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, being published. Um, a decade later, we see Donella Meadows and her colleagues at MIT um, do, producing Limits to Growth. And then uh, about a decade from that period of time, we see Lynn Margulis's work in Symbiosis and Cell Evolution. Okay. And these are really foundations of what has become uh, environmentalism and ecological studies today. All of this, all of this thinking from Carson and Magulis and so forth have evolved into a real paradigm shift. And this paradigm shift that I'm speaking about comes from the Post Carbon Institute out on the West Coast. Um, Richard Heinberg has been central in putting together this paradigm shift. I don't have all of the I'm not going to be talking about all of the different areas of the shift, but I have them in this presentation that I'll pull up so that they can be recorded um, and people will have access to them later. A paradigm shift. Here we go. We have been in a system of continual growth and we need to move toward a sustainable resilience period. And when I think about so many of the different aspects of what was covered in, in Morgan's work, uh, thinking about housing and the individual and even energy and food and health and so forth. I mean, these are all part of the transition that we see taking place, at least in terms of the thinking. The area that I wanna focus specifically on is locality, education, work, and economy. So in thinking about localities, again, I would like for you, if you would, please, to take a look at the old paradigm and the new paradigm. We are in the old paradigm still. The new paradigm is emerging. How much of the new paradigm is reflective of the thinking and work of Morgan? So going through the new paradigm, bioregions and localization would be the place that people live. Bioregions, he already was talking about regions and concentrating on regions rather than looking at the big national whole. Uh, contracted urban and rural areas, combining them. Resource su sufficient conserving communities with a high degree of social integration and interconnected built environments. Um, this is the new paradigm that is emerging and it's really telling to me how reflective it is of the thinking that he was involved in decades ago. Thinking about education, when we think about the economy and work, of course today we think first and foremost of education as being the process through which one prepares for that life. Again, looking at the new paradigm, vocational oriented, community benefit oriented, training for the community, intrinsic values of self-actualization, um, being ecology centered, cooperation, reward skills and relationships, real hands on skills training and training for sustainability. You know, this is the, if you look at the old paradigm on the screen, you'll see where we are, career oriented, individual achievement, training for globalization, et cetera, et cetera. This is where we are. And this, the new paradigm is where we need to be moving toward. And already Morgan was moving in that direction. Looking at work, the new paradigm required set, satisfying activity to meet needs. Uh, work that is fulfilling and self-worth uh, activities. Work benefits that uh, benefit the community. Non-stratified class labor. Okay, I love, I love what we just heard about ownership of, of the business. Ecologically sound practices, paid salaried according to community needs, meets demands of ecological sustainability and cooperative relationships. Again, in looking at the old paradigm, which we are fully entrenched in, forced selling of labor, working for money, alienating activities, work benefits shareholders, 
and stratified class labels, unhealthy, dangerous activities, paid shared according to hierarchy, meets demands of consumer society and competitive relationships. This is where we are. Again, Morgan was moving toward where we need to be. And what's recognized today increasingly as where we need to move to. And finally, getting to economy, you know, going through thinking about where is where is education and work done, and then thinking about what kind of economy do we have? Well, moving toward the new paradigm, we're thinking about a relocalized basket of economic arrangements, renewable and sustainable source-based, diffused, decentralized power, community-centered, wealth based on skills and relationships eco-based consumption of resources, living with the boundaries of nature, community and cooperative based ownership, and multi-exchange systems such as bartering system, local currencies, time banks, and micro lending. This is the new paradigm. This is the new economy. And as you see, it's moving away from the globalized capitalist system, finite fossil fuel, uses, profit-centered, hyper-consumption of natural resources, and so forth. If Arthur E. Morgan were here today, these would be the wisdoms and lessons I'm sure he would recognize and teach about. Societal stability is rooted in ecological stability. I want to repeat that. Societal stability is rooted in ecological stability. We cannot have societal stability if we do not have a planet that is functioning. The foundations of both the large D and the small D democratic life are intertwined with humankind's connection to and dependence on the rest of nature. He would recognize the Earth's ecosystems are the sources of real wealth, biodiversity, healthy soil, plentiful water, and photosynthesis. What he would be fighting against is the deforestation, industrial agriculture, wetland destruction, prairie and savanna degradation, desertification, and mega urbanization. These are things that he would find, I think, atrocious, and he would be fully engaged in the bioregionalism, ecological restructuring, reconstruction efforts that are just really beginning to take place around the world. So what are the foundations of community? Bioregions as organizing entities for human communities, resource sufficient and conservation minded practices, a built environment interconnected with the natural world, ecological restoration promoting biodiversity, photosynthesis and soil life. Recognition of symbiosis and cooperation as ubiquitous throughout nature and regenerative agriculture and life centers. And that's one of the things that I am sure he would be in full support of today, and that is the emergence of agraria. Agraria is really a center that is pulling together all of these different strands and creating a community based entity within a bioregion that is multicultural, erasing, attempting to erase class boundaries, bringing people together, having opportunities for people to research and explore nature, for young people to be engaged in the natural world, and for people to be sharing the bounty of what this earth has to offer. That is the real wealth. And I think that if Morgan were here with us today, that is what he would be talking about. We have this wonderful journal at Agraria that teaches us so much. Every, every few months we get this. And I am sure, I know, that Arthur Morgan would be in the thick of the work that's being done right now by the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration 2021 through 2030. Here is my contact information. I'm going to go through, so for the benefit of the uh, recording, 
I'm going to go through the remaining slides of the paradigm shift so that you'll have access to them. And I love this final one, the community as core, cohesion and belonging, social integration, identity through being, not having, but identity through being, integrated child rearing, people-centered socialization, empowerment, self-actualization, cooperation and collaboration. Think how different that is from the dominant paradigm today of individual as core, atomization and isolation, socially alienated lives, identity through having rather than through being, fragmented child rearing. Think about the discussion going on in DC right now about paying for child care, techno-driven socialization, disempowerment, psychic alienation, competition and manipulation. I like the new paradigm better and I'm sure Morgan would too. Thank you. Susan? Yeah, I'm having a hard time. Let's see, where am I? Can Am I muted or unmuted? Um, I'm hearing you. So you oh, great. Oh, good. I, I couldn't find my little uh, microphone. Thank you so much for that, Nancy, and thanks for the shout out uh, for Agraria, which of course is the legacy or is one of the legacy organizations of um, Arthur Morgan, uh -huh. another um, organization that uh, is, uh, is directly rooted in Arthur Morgan's thinking is the Schumacher Center for New Economics in Massachusetts. And we have with us today, Rachel Moriarty, who's the Director of Operations at the Center. She manages the organization so it can effectively house both its national and local programs. She also helps to implement the Schumacher Center's practical applications of new economic thinking in the Berkshire regions of Western Massachusetts. Born and raised in the Berkshires, her connections with local people and knowledge of local institutions provide a cultural context for establishing meaningful connections and effective systemic change in that region. And in fact, that's one reason I wanted to make sure that the, um, someone from the Schumacher Center presented because they're an awesome organization that really does a good job of connecting their philosophical and intellectual inquiries with um, on the ground work. So Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And um, Nancy, I think you might need to stop sharing your screen. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks. There we go. Okay. <laughs> um, and Nancy, I, I really appreciate you going first because um, I'm essentially going to pick up where, where you left off and the work of the Schumacher Center here in uh, the Western Mass region of the Berkshires um, really does try to bring about that new paradigm. So um, we have pretty exciting work here, but I guess I'll start here. So this slide right here is of E.F. Schumacher and Bob Swan. So E.F. Schumacher is there on the left, Bob Swan on the right. And the Schumacher Center, of course, is named for E.F. Schumacher. He wrote the book, Small is Beautiful, Economics as If People Mattered. And his um, push was really to organize systems and economies in terms of regions. So um, echoing the work of Arthur Morgan as well. But the work of Bob Swan, who helped to coordinate E.F. Schumacher's United States tour of um, Small is Beautiful was really as a student of nonviolence. Um, Bob Swan was a peace activist and as a result um, ended up serving a stint in federal prison as a conscientious objector during World War II for his um, 
objection of military service. And Bob Swan was in Ashland um, Federal Prison with this person here on the right, which is Bayard Rustin, who helped to train Martin Luther King Jr. in nonviolent um, organizing. And while they were in prison, um, they were the benefactors of the correspondence course hosted by Arthur Morgan. Uh, so in that course of core uh, of the the identity of the course was to talk about uh, the small community, but Arthur Morgan was also bringing in texts like Kropotkin's Mutual Aid and Lewis Mumford's uh, teachings on the commons and ownership of land and scale and works of Liberty Hyde Bailey on um, agrarianism and regenerative agriculture. Now, these are all things that we talk about today, but then they were known as decentralism. And today we talk about them as new economics. Um, I would say today we are more inclusive of different identities in, in our work. Um, at, and at a time when Bob Swan and, and Bayard Rustin were organizing, it wasn't as accepting. Um, but Bob Swan, after he left, or excuse me, while they were in uh, this federal prison, they thought a lot about the root causes of war as they were taking this correspondence course and ultimately came to the conclusion that there were three main root causes of war. One was the commodification of land and the ability to privatize and and earn money on a nature given right. The second was the ability for nation states to issue their own currency and do things like fund war and bail out banks and leading to inflation. And then ultimately the third was the um, loss of community in the face of globalization. And that's really that Arthur Morgan principle. And so when Bob Swan left prison, when he got out of prison, he, um, resumed his life as a builder and, and um, in, in physical building trades, but also in community building. And so here's a picture of him with organizers of the Albany movement in Albany, Georgia, where he met up with folks like Charles Sherrod there on the right, and then also with Slater King, who is seen here on the left. And at the time, the Albany movement was trying to figure out how to gain access to land so that they could build um, farming communities, intentional communities. And so this picture here is of Slater King, Bob Swan, Marion King, and Faye Bennett on a trip to Israel to study the, um, the leases of the Jewish National Fund. Now, they also looked at the village gift movement for inspiration on how to separate land from activity on top of the land so that they could further the work of decommodifying the land on top of it. Now through this, they formed the first community land trust in the United States. And the community land trust is now a, a movement, global movement. There are about 250 community land trusts in the US. Um, but what it really is, is a nonprofit that holds land on behalf of the community to um, identify uh, uses like housing, farming, workforce development, um, things that are culturally appropriate to the region, and then forms land use plans on for each site and leases that are 98 years and inheritable so that um, the land is held in perpetuity and remains affordable for that reason. So one of the contributions that Bob Swan brought to the community land trust model was this idea of a tripart board. So you would have equal representation. And again, as Nancy said, that gets back to the democracy element of um, Arthur Morgan and many of the nonviolent peace activists that um, looked up to Morgan's teachings. Now, the community land trust in the Southern Berkshires, um, along with the Schumacher Center for a New Economics, was formed in 1980, and it holds 49 acres across three different sites in our region, and there are 24 leaseholders in total. So this here is a picture of our Forest Row community, which has uh, 18 units of clustered housing in single-family homes, duplexes, and quads. Um, 
it allows for recreational space, it allows for community development. And so the 18 families that live at this site um, share expenses in some way, but they also have individual leaseholds. So should they ever decide to sell their home on the community land trust, they are restricted um, by a formula that says they can sell it for the cost of replacement adjusted for deterioration. So that means they don't own the land and they can earn what they put into the house, but no more. And that is another element that ensures the uh, uh, permanent affordability of, of the housing. Another site that the community land trust in the Southern Berkshire has is Indian Line Farm. And this is the home of one of the first community supported agriculture experiments in the region. There are about 17 acres here. And the community land trust partnered with the Nature Conservancy for an easement on some of the more ecologically sensitive lands. The community land trust owns all 17 acres. And then the young farmers, well, young at the time in, in 99, um, purchased the home, they purchased the barn, the structures on it. And should they ever decide to give up farming and, and leave, they can sell that farm, they can sell the barn, the greenhouses, any structures, but they can also sell the perennial stock. So they've put in orchards and raspberry bushes that has economic value and uniquely um, incorporated into the land use plan was um, the cost of or the condition of the soil. And so as organic farmers, they're encouraged to maintain and amend and develop healthy organic soils. And so they can put a dollar value on the soil organic matter built over the years. And then finally, the third property is the one that I am uh, currently located at where the Schumacher Center has its building. There are four other um, residences here. There's an orchard, which we use for community spaces. Um, and this is another way that people are able to gain access to what would otherwise be a multi-million dollar piece of property in the Southern Berkshires where we have second, third and fourth homeowners, um, they are able to use the land and develop community and households. And unique to the community land trust structure, um, and this is a new development, is the ability to have what's known as a title holding corporation. So this 501c2, which is a partner organization under the umbrella of a 501c3, which allows local control of the assets, but um, education and fundraising at a more uh, large scale regional level. And this can be used for something like the Berkshires where we could have a Southern Berkshire Community Land Trust and Northern Berkshire Community Land Trust with our own sites, but it can also be wielded um, at a national or international level. So for instance, if you've heard of Agrarian Trust, that's an initiative to get young people farming on the land. They are looking to explore this model, whereas uh, the national 501c3 is able to work with these localized 501c2 organizations. Another application is with um, movements towards reparations. So um, there's an initiative for the Black Commons and commons around indigenous communities. And so this is another way to kind of have this national catcher's mitt to say here, donate land, donate money to this movement, and then we will work with the local communities. And that again, is that more Arthur Morgan idea of uh, democratic control at a, a local regional level. And the other element that we work on at the Schumacher Center is the idea of local currencies. So identifying how people can be more engaged with monetary issue in their region, but also just to think about um, economic activity at a more intentional level. So there were many different experiments starting in the 1980s around um, collateralizing loans for small businesses through a, an organization called the Self-Help Self-Help Association for a Regional Economy. And then here on the right are two examples of local script issues. So there were the deli dollars, there were Berkshire Farm Preserve notes, 
And you can see they are physically demonstrating what they intend to do. So the deli dollars were to help a business owner move his the physical location of his deli so people could redeem their deli dollars after his move in their eggs and coffee and bacon um, and cheese sandwiches. And then with the Berkshire Farm Preserve notes, two farms collaborated to issue these to acquire funds in the slow part of their season. And so in 2006, after all of these local experiments with the communities, the merchants, the businesses, um, the bankers, we launched our current program called Berkshires. And the way that that works is as a consumer, you would go into a bank and you exchange 95 cents per one Berkshire. And then, so you have a 5% incentive to go spend those notes in the local economy. The businesses that accept them, of which there are 400, can continue to circulate those Berkshires for the procurement of goods and services for their own uses. And then if they ever want to, they can take it back to the bank, at which time they'll only get 95% of their Berkshire. So in that way, it's a disincentive to, um, to cashing in. And so that launched in 2006. So we are officially celebrating our 15th anniversary this year. And something we've seen over the past few years is that, and this may be true for many of you here in the audience, that not many people carry cash anymore. Not many people go into a bank anymore. Um, the, quite literally, the landscape of our main streets is different. The business owners that were there in 2006 or even two years ago before COVID are no longer there, unfortunately. So, so our economy is changing. Um, now, as you just saw, there have been many different iterations of local currency experiments in the region. And so what we are now moving towards is a digital iteration of our local currency um, that will function similarly to Venmo, digital payments app, and will have um, an embedded directory and elements of storytelling that our, our physical notes so beautifully do with the local heroes and the artwork on the back. So. This is something that we're launching in December. We'll see how it works. Um, but I guess that's all to say that our work with the Schumacher Center is to practice in place and create models for broad replication. Um, and both of these elements are really importantly embedded in community. So each has a local board of directors, has membership of, um, local residents. And that is another way to help facilitate the transparency of economic activity. And finally, this is um, our physical location of the Schumacher Center. We hold EF Schumacher's personal library. Um, we hold the work of folks like Richard Bliss, who is working on appropriate technology, or excuse me, the, uh, the Catholic workers movement, um, William Ellis, who is working on appropriate technology, George Bonello, who was working on um, and reading about elements of worker cooperatives. And we just acquired the work of Murray Bookchin, who was a, a self-described self eco-anarchist. Um, so this has really become a home base for many of these uh, ideas that have are, are having a resurgence really, you know, we're, we're seeing with Arthur Morgan, we're talking about his legacy. Um, these aren't new ideas, uh, but they are important ideas. And at the Schumacher Center, we're, we're very proud to help steward that work um, and continue to apply the principles in our community. So I'll leave it there and turn it back to Susan. Thanks so much, Rachel. That was really beautiful. Another note about the Schumacher Center is that they have um, regular conversations with leaders in new economic thought. So you might want to check out their website. They, they're doing really fabulous work. And yes. We're very grateful that you were here with us. Thank you, Rachel. Mm -hmm. So next up, we have Sherelle Gardner, who is from Co-op Dayton. She joined them in 2020 to help build the just economy that we need and deserve in Dayton, Ohio. Originally from Columbus, Sherelle moved here to study as an undergraduate at the University of Dayton and has since made Dayton her home. She earned her master's degree in education at Wright State University and worked in diversity, equity, and inclusion at local universities. 
Terrell came to Co-op Dayton as a member owner of the Gem City Market Cooperative and a facilitator and leader of other co-op projects, including a trucking co-op, fitness co-op, and real estate investment cooperative. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to have you here, um, Sherelle. I do need to mention that Leela Klein, um, who is one of the co-founders of um, Co-op Dayton, is an Antioch grad and Yellow Springs uh, favorite. So, Sherelle, do, would you like to get started? Absolutely. Thanks for having me, everyone. So yes, I'm Cheryl Gardner. I am the program director at Co-op Dayton and really excited to talk to you all today about how Co-op Dayton is building economic power in Dayton, Ohio. Um, to really understand that, I think we have to kind of set the groundwork of what Dayton has been experiencing for several decades. Um, and so this is a picture of the old GM building, something that is, is very near and dear to our hearts, uh, as that for generations, Dayton was known as the home of innovation and industrial production. And according to records from the US Patent Office, in 1890, Dayton had more patents per capita than any other city in the country. And we were ranked fifth in the nation as early as 1870 from the Wright brothers to Charles F. Kettering, from NCR uh, to Frigidaire and GM, Dayton was an epicenter for innovation and manufacturing. And that became a part of our city's DNA. The anchors of our economy and the city's civic fabric like companies like GM produced high quality products, provided family sustaining jobs for tens of thousands of Daytonians and invested in our city because they felt that their company's success was strongly tied to the success of our city. But unfortunately, a lot has changed since those days. And since our peak in 1960, 262,332 residents, our, city po our city's population has been on the decline. We saw the biggest drop in 1980 when over 20% of our population left the city. And it's since stabilized over the past 10 years, but we're still feeling the effects of that. Um, due to a variety of local and national and international factories, it's pretty safe to say that today's economy is fundamentally different than the economy of our parents' and grandparents' generations. I know and heard several stories of people talking about having dozens of employers in their careers with zero benefits, low wages, and no loyalty. Our peers talk about the work environment that they've worked at and they're encouraged or expected to stay for more than five years, um, but never offer compensation uh, or jobs that pay family sustaining wages. And so we've felt the impacts of that, not just in the loss of these industries and employment, but because these major companies left, there have been ripple effects because of these massive layoffs. Um, in West Dayton specifically, before we talk about the project that I will talk about later on in this presentation, you would be hard find, hard pressed to find a grocery store um, and, and still harder pressed to find a dry cleaners or a coffee shop, a non fast food restaurant or even a hardware store in West Dayton. And while downtown is seeing new development, which is really exciting, even still it's a ghost town on weekends and after the work weeks. Many of our residents have to drive at least 20 minutes to the suburbs or embark on a three hour round trip venture, taking multiple buses just to get access to healthy and affordable food at grocery stores. And the picture you're seeing here is a, a picture of the abandoned Kroger's that closed in 2008. And so Dayton was looking for a solution um, and this ties in to Arthur Morgan's vision and, and thoughts around business, particularly small businesses and how businesses can be used to meet our common needs when the goals are not focused around greed, but focused on economic self-reliance and serving human needs. So we see businesses as the answer to the challenges that we're facing, but we needed a business model that could be used to ensure that the anchors of our economy and the resources necessary to meet our basic human needs remained rooted in our community. 
and that unlike much of what we saw and continue to see that the businesses in our neighborhoods would pay family sustaining wages or at least living wages, that these businesses would invest in our community and that the community, the workers and those impacted by the businesses would have the power to share in the responsibilities and rewards of the decisions that were being made. And so that is the belief that Co-op Dayton is founded on. Uh, we're formerly known as Greater Dayton Union Co-op, so some of you might know us as Caducci, but we originally started with the dual mission of addressing Dayton's food crisis and supporting worker ownership. But that's since evolved into a larger vision of building an economy that works for everyone, specifically through worker and community ownership. Dayton was once known as the birthplace of innovation, and today we're known as the second hungriest community in the country with, for families with children. And we at Co-op Dayton believe that we have the opportunity to change this through shared ownership. And so we're starting with food access. As I mentioned earlier, one of the ripple effects, especially in West Dayton, um, because of the loss of these anchor businesses like GM and NCR, was that we also lost businesses that provided access to fresh healthy and affordable food. And so this is the issue we started with in the creation of Gem City Market, a worker and community owned full service grocery store located in Lower Salem Avenue. And, it, and it's tricky and, and amazing at the same time because corporate grocers fled Dayton for decades and probably will continue to do so, uh, most notably with the closure of Kroger's in 2008, followed by the closure of Aldi's in 2018. And these created what the USDA refers to as a food desert, where low income areas also have low access to a full service grocery store. Um, there'll be access to food through corner stores or general dollars or fast food restaurants, but not the full service grocery stores that we need and are accustomed to shopping at to get access to the fresh and healthy food that we use in our everyday lives. But we call these things food apartheid because food deserts say that these are naturally occurring things, not man-made things as a result of the decisions that have been made. We think that the cooperative model provides an ideal and innovative solution to address this challenge where collective ownership, control and responsibilities allow us to pull together our unique skills and talents and resources to build an economy that works for all of us. And so there were two things that we had to do to make this work because there's a reason that co corporate grocers weren't looking at our area that didn't find it to be viable. We had to co create a strategy and a vision that met the needs of the community, but also made it for a viable business that can stay in the community. So to make this work, we needed both community and financial capital, two things that are often unseen or undervalued in low income communities like ours. And Gem City Market is, and will, we hope, continue to be a vibrant community and worker-owned cooperative in the 300 block of Salem that utilizes a unique multi-stakeholder model um, where the store is owned by those who most need this resource, the employees that work there and the community that shops there. We also have incorporated a really unique hybrid pricing system um, where the market can be aggressively priced can offer aggressively priced pantry items and produce as well as local and organic specialty goods at slightly higher price points so that we can offer some of the more affordable options um, at, at a lower price or competitive price to Kroger's and Myers and other grocery stores outside of our area by increasing the price of organic produce, um, with the assumption and the idea that people are coming into our community to shop in solidarity and give their dollars to the market so that we can provide this resource to the community. We also offer what we consider to be third spaces. So it's more than just a grocery store. So there's a community room, a teaching kitchen and a clinic so that people are able to interact and engage in the spaces um, in, in ways outside of just access to healthy food. 
And so what's really been incredible about this process is the creation of the shared vision, where people pull together their talents to make sure that this store was open successfully. Um, people on their own saw community needs in these neighborhoods, and so they found ways to address them uh, as an example of how Gem City Market addresses community needs. Gym City Market would feed people as a grocery store. So people held potlucks and started community gardens. Uh, they, it would act as a third space. And so they held gatherings and opened their homes and held meeting greets to talk about the market. And it would be a connector to resources. So they did door knocking and phone banking, not just to inform people about the market, but to check in on their neighbors and the members to find out what they needed and what resources we could provide. And there is research that shows that co-ops work for community member owners, they're loyal customers. It's giving the community control over a needed resource. For employees, there's increased operational efficiencies through programming like open book management and leadership development. There's also business success. So there is usually higher sales and productivity growth, higher retention of employees, and these businesses are more likely to remain over a 10 year period. And so we're excited that Gym City Market opened on May 12th and that we're over 5,000 members strong. So looking to the future, where is Co-op Dayton going? Over six years of organizing has given us a lot of information of future market gaps that we can begin to address. We can continue to find ways to provide access to healthy and affordable food because one grocery store isn't going to do it. There's also increased concerns around gentrification now that there's this multi-million dollar anchor in the neighborhood and people are starting to look at this neighborhood as a viable resource. And there's concerns about it pushing out people who have lived there all of their lives. There's also, and there's just continuing to be housing needs. And so what are models that we can use like community land trusts and real estate cooperatives to address these? and also creating pathways to sustainable jobs. So we're doing this finally through our network. We're working with over eight cooperatives and social enterprises, including Gym City Market, to build a community where instead of looking to outside sources and answers, we're looking to each other to create the resources that we need to do well and thrive in our community. And so we're exploring industries, everything from food to housing and healthcare. And as our community come to us with other needs, we're looking for innovative solutions to address them. That was really terrific. Thank you so much, Cheryl, and for your, your wonderful work. I was really struck by many of the um, intersections between your work and Lee's work and your work and Rachel's work and, and all of your work and the, and the principles that Nancy talked about in terms of the paradigm shift. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes to talk about the economic, um, economic piece of community solutions work. Tomorrow we'll hear more about the community piece. Uh, and um, as I mentioned, when we started out today, Arthur Morgan founded Community Service in 1940, so he had already done many of the things that we heard about today, including his work at the TVA and at Antioch College. Uh, and economics are threaded uh, throughout Arthur Morgan's um, interests and then also the interests of community solutions slash community service. One of the interesting intersections with what Rachel was talking about in terms of um, alternative currencies as the Yellow Springs Exchange was one of the first alternative currencies in the country. It was uh, founded by Arthur Morgan during, uh, during the depression and it was very interesting. It's interesting to read about his ideas because basically as Sherelle and others pointed out, people going hungry is not necessarily because there isn't food around or you know, factories being closed doesn't mean that there are people who aren't interested in working in them. And so Arthur Morgan and others recognize that there are other ways to be trading goods and services besides uh, the US dollar or other, um, other standard currencies. And as a, um, economics has been threaded throughout uh, and Arthur Morgan's uh, son here, um, Ernest, 
Ernest, Gris, excuse me, Griska Morgan and Jane Morgan, who were successors to Arthur Morgan in community solutions, spent a lot of time writing about and talking about different ways that communities could be solid economically. <clears throat> And the organization has run conferences throughout its history. We are now approaching our 120th conference this fall. Um, the Self-Reliant Community is one of the conferences in 1987. And basically all the conferences have been focused on ways that communities can work together to provide for needs, again, sometimes beyond standard economics. It's, the organization has also been known for its writing and films beyond Arthur Morgan's books. Um, Pat Murphy, who sadly recently passed away, produced several books under the Arthur Morgan um, Institute uh, imprint. And more recently, we've been producing journals. Uh, these are a few of them. And we also do conferences uh, focused on different issues. These I've put up some pictures of, of our conferences that focus on economic issues, just to kind of give you a sense of some of our interests, which do intersect with Schumacher and, and other organizations that we heard about here. This was a conf these were conferences uh, with the minimalists and with Sarah Burns from the Institute for Policy Studies, which looks at uh, ways to share wealth. There's Nicole Foss there on the left-hand side. She's really interested in peak oil and ways uh, that communities can develop resilient uh, economic and energy systems. And Matt Stannard came to speak with us at a conference a few years ago about community banking and the importance of community banking. Uh, the Economics of Happiness conference we had a few years ago in collaboration with Helen Norberg Hodge up there on the right hand side and Charles Eisenstein and Michael Schumann. Uh, we looked at all the different ways that communities can start to repair the damage that's been done by uh, economic growth and figure out ways, again, to work together, not only uh, locally, but across national boundaries. So about five years ago in 2017, we moved from being an organization that was primarily a think tank to a think and do tank by buying um, 128 acres on the outskirts of Yellow Springs. We bought this farm at auction. We call it now Agraria. Uh, and this is, a, this is a vision of the uh, restoration of Jacoby Creek, which is one of our primary projects uh, with the Nature Conservancy who are restoring uh, the creek and re-meandering the creek. We're also doing a number of regenerative practices, including permaculture and perennial plantings, doing a lot of uh, research projects as well as education. But since this is an economics presentation, I did wanna focus on our food work because food, the way we grow food and trade food is really the basis of all economies. And as, as you may know by reading the newspaper or by looking at the grocery shel shelves, a lot of our food now is grown at, you know, at the other end of the country or the other end of the planet. And that's becoming increasingly problematic um, because of the challenge of supply chains of energy, energy price ri raising, rising, energy prices rising and um, water and soil becoming scarce. And so um, there's a real push now or to really look at the relocalization of food systems. And that's one of the primary parts of Agraria's work. And this is just a little bit of a, these are four photos about our work on the upper left-hand side is um, a food stand that we support in Springfield. We also received a $400,000 grant from the USDA a few years ago to buy a farm and an education center in South Springfield. That's sort of a mini agraria. And like West Dayton, South Springfield is a food desert with no um, grocery stores within, uh, within walking distance of, of most of the residents. Um, on the upper right-hand side, we have our, um, maybe not our favorite uh, Antioch professor, but one of our favorite Antioch professors, Beth Bridgman, who's doing a reskilling class with our regenerative fellows, uh, we received a grant to do a training for BIPOC fellows last year and uh, have started this regenerative training to teach uh, under-resourced farmers how to grow regeneratively and then how to think about supporting themselves and their communities through their work. On the lower left-hand side, you see some of our young, beautiful, energetic, and capable staff who are grew a lot of food at Agraria this year. Primarily, it was 
then um, given to the Yellow Springs community and then also the Springfield community. We also support the Yellow Springs uh, farmers market through the SNAP program. Um, at, yes. And then the other piece of our work, which has really blossomed over the last year regarding economics and food, is that we um, hosted a Black farming conference last year. And because of COVID, it went viral, it went virtual and then viral. We had over 1,200 people sign up for the conference. And that has really spurred a lot of work, including the Regenerative Fellows um, Project. This is an upcoming workshop uh, next week, actually, a land access workshop. As um, Rachel was speaking about, one of the big challenges for all farmers and particularly under resourced farmers is access to land and especially long-term access to land because you don't become a successful farmer overnight. Um, and so there's a real um, need for us if we're thinking about how to rebuild our local food systems to really think about how to provide and act on uh, providing access to land for farmers. So we, along with the Schumacher Center, are exploring uh, land access as a reparation strategy. In fact, we have incubating farmers at um, Agraria, and we're looking to increase that part of our work. And finally, I just want to give a quick plug to for our um, next conference, which is in three weeks on uh, water, uh, Pathways to Regeneration. It also has some economic conversation around the importance of keeping water as a community resource and not a corporate resource. So we hope, hope that you will think about joining us there. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and start talking, start discussion. So um, I know I, I haven't looked at the chat recently, but I know there's a lot of interest in Lee, you sharing your um, slideshow and people being really grateful to have heard the story in a really concise way. So thank you very much for taking the time to share that with us. How do I share it? Just kind of, so you have it, you wanna just share Yeah, it? if people are interested in it, we can put, um, uh, David, maybe you could put our email address in the chat, and we would be happy to share that as well as the link to the paradigm document that Nancy mentioned that the uh, that Post Carbon put out. There are a few slides at the end, Susan, that we can delete. Okay. All right. What any any questions for our participants, Rachel? I know um, I, I really appreciate. I know you have. Like we like community solutions has 80 years of history that are hard to you know put into five slides and same with a Schumacher Center. I'm I'm really excited about uh, your work on the Black Commons, uh, which you mentioned briefly. But since that's an interest of ours, and I think of other folks on this on this um, call, maybe you would talk a little bit about that um, that conversation and maybe also your work in um, Boston. I'm not sure what you mean by the work in Boston. Um, Wisdom, uh, okay, there's the community there that you help to support, uh, the community land trust. Oh, so the um, Dudley Street? Yes. Okay, um, so yes, thank you. The We issued a, a white paper on this idea of a black commons as a vehicle for reparations. I will give the disclaimer that the Schumacher Center is a white-led organization and we are not in the position to be stewarding this work. That would be inappropriate. Um, but we did apply the knowledge that we have going all the way back to Bob Swan's participation with new communities in helping to acquire the 5,000 acres to help um, the form the first community land trust and enable black farmers in the South to, to gain access to land. Um, and so with that 501c3, 501c2 title holding corporation um, relationship, we identified a path in which, um, you know, you could have a national organization call for donations of land in the name of reparations and then distribute to any appropriate associated 501c2 title holding uh, local community land trust. And that is something that is continuing to circulate. People are iterating upon it um, based on their work, their experience, their uh, communities. And so 
I think it's really being adapted in um, at, at a local level. To my knowledge, nothing ha- uh, nothing formally has um, come about at for like that catcher's mitt uh, national organization, um, but it's still something that's being discussed. Um, the relationship with the Dudley Street Neighborhood um, Association, which is the uh, community land trust in the Roxbury Dorchester neighborhood, just outside of Boston, is that um, our one of our long-term board members turned um, staff people, Greg Watson, who served as the commissioner of agriculture of Massachusetts for two separate terms, um, was one of the early organizers of, of Dudley Street. And that um, is a, a unique story in that, um, excuse me, the neighborhood, uh, which had been historically disinvested in, was able to gain access to the land through eminent domain because um, it was blighted, there were absentee landlords. And so these residents went to the city of Boston and said, we want um, power of eminent domain so that we can take back our community. That is now um, a thriving community land trust. It's one of the best examples in the country as is um, the Burlington Land Trust, um, which was in part supported and um, organized by the work of Bernie Sanders as mayor. And then another new iteration that we've been looking at is um, the impact on island communities and how climate change is um, affecting their their work. Um, But so the the Island Housing Trust, which is a CLT on Martha's Vineyard off the coast of Massachusetts, was finding that their emergency responders, their teachers couldn't afford to live on island because housing costs were so high, land costs were so high. And so they intervened to establish a community land trust and build um, affordable, appropriately scaled housing so that um, such essential workers could uh, could live on island and um, you know report to duty as, as they were called. So there's a lot of really cool stuff happening in the community land trust space. Um, and I'm excited to see how, how the Black Commons idea develops. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Cheryl, or Cheryl, right? I'm sorry, I mispronounced your name. Um, we have some real interest in finding out what's going on. Um, everybody was so excited when um, Gem City Market opened up and we know you have a lot of programming going on. So would you like to give us a little bit of an update of what's been happening since you, um, since you opened up? Absolutely. So there's typically programming in all three of our uh, community spaces. So there's the teaching kitchen, um, the health clinic, and the community room. The community room can be rented out for events. So there, uh, there's always a calendar of events uh, in the actual space. And then the teaching kitchen, we usually have partners in there doing teaching demonstrations. Or I found out there's a, a group that gets together every Saturday to meal prep. So they purchase their groceries from the store and then come meal prep together. Thanks, Sherelle. And a, and a follow-up question, Are is there any discussion or movement to establish additional sites? That feels like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so we, for the last two years, have been supporting Healthy Family Market, which will be uh, a market further into West Dayton that focuses specifically on those uh, families who receive WIC and STAP benefits. And so I think that's been our that's our uh, way of helping in the future. I don't think Co-op Dayton itself might start grocery stores, but with our experience, we would work with communities who want to start a market similar um, and, and give that industri- that industry knowledge that we have. Great, thank you so much. I, I have a question for Nancy, who, who is um, my guru of all things new economics. Nancy, you recently taught or you're currently teaching a new economics course. And I know, sadly, a lot of economics classes in business schools and in, in higher ed are really not talking about cooperative models or alternative currencies or barter systems or relocalization of food systems. 
And so, you know, maybe talk a little bit about what the state is in education and or any ideas if people are interested in new economic ideas, where they where they should look. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm afraid that uh, the macroeconomics and microeconomics courses still are in the conventional traditions and that there's very little effort, I find on the college and university level for there to be the integration of thinking about a new economy. But uh, a new economy is absolutely critical. Co the, the cooperative, I love, I love Cheryl's work on cooperatives because that is exactly the democratization of economics. And that's what we need to have. We have this huge schism between the very rich and, and a growing uh, poor class. Um, a very small, very rich group who can send space shuttles up into the air uh, for entertainment. And we see people struggling to put food on the table. Um, one of the key things that I try to do in terms of the work that I do as an educator is to encourage my colleagues to incorporate some of the ideas of, for instance, time banks and cooperatives uh, and different kinds of cooperatives, not only uh, food and worker cooperatives, but also housing cooperatives, uh, banking cooperatives, and so forth. Um, there is, uh, there's a growing number of uh, people concerned about transforming the economy. And if you do a Google search for the new economy, you'll see work that's being done in this area. But also, I've been impressed by the work from Post Carbon Institute where they look at economic factors and the transformation of the economy as well. But um, there's a lot of work to be done. And the, the critical issue for me, I think, is um, you know, how do you get this information out? And I've, you know, I've been thinking, uh, I'd love to have both Rachel and Cheryl come and talk with my classes. Maybe we can have a Zoom meeting because uh, I teach a course called Food, Famine, and Farming in the Global Village. And Cheryl, I know people would love to know about setting up food cooperatives in that area. And I have young farmers looking for land, Rachel, and needing land. Uh, they want to do farming. They're committed to farming, but they can't afford land. So, I mean, there's a lot of work that's, that needs to be done that's going on and so forth. But uh, the critical thing, I think what people have to do is really, you know, engage instructors, whether it's at the high school level or the college or university level, and say, you know, what are you doing? Are you talking about these issues? Because I find that these issues just are not being talked about in places where people can get the kind of education that they need to have to go out and be, you know, putting it into the community. The work that Rachel and Cheryl are doing are far more important than so much of what I see happening at the college and university level. Thank you, Nancy. I see somebody um, pointed out that the University of Southern New Hampshire has a community economic development master's program. So that might be something for folks to check out. I think one of the challenges as I'm listening to all of you is, and of course, I mean, we're not the first ones who are talking about relocalization because the people that were our forebears were speaking about this, you know, decades ago. But I think one of the things that concerns me is how quickly things can devolve in terms of our, again, in terms of our supply chains, as we all saw a couple of years ago, and we're seeing again, and then how, how, um, how long it takes to grow food or to prep a farm. So that, that time scale challenge is really um, very difficult. And I'm sorry, I don't know if anybody would like to respond to that while I turn off my phone. <laughs> I'll ask a I'll ask a question while she's turning off her phone. Okay. Uh, not being an academician, I view these issues as ones of what I refer to as continuous improvement, and I worry sometimes that we see these choices as binary. It's either one or the other, mm -hmm. and I think that's a that's dangerous because it it slows us down. I'm thinking of the environmental stuff in particular. At the company, we did a triple bottom line report where we imported our, our environmental impacts and social impacts as well as our financial. And I've observed that the International Standards Organization, the, uh, the, the, the advocates for 
ISO this and that and the other thing, they have an environmental one now. And it's not a question of, are you environmental? It's a question of how quickly you're becoming environmental. It's about moving in the right direction. Um, it's about becoming, not being. And I, I think we have to be a little cautious about making this a binary choice. Uh, it is a very complex, and I see a lot of paths. And I'm, I'm also thinking of the Gem City Co-op, which I think is marvelous. And from my point of view, the one thing that I'm wondering is whether you have conventional uh, grocery marketers involved on your boards or an advisory capacity, people who bring, uh, it probably conventional, but it's sympathetic expertise. I just worry that we try to do some of this stuff in isolation from the broader economy. And by the way, Sherelle, Sherelle, I love it, what you're doing. I think it's fabulous. Yeah, I was, I'm going to let her answer the question about the conventional grocers, because I know that they, they are speaking to everyone, but I, I totally agree, Lee, and that was why I was glad you kicked us off. I think thinking about the mission of the Antioch Book Play Company and the way that you work with the employees and fact that you had employee ownership is really not that different than what's happening at the Gem City Market, though I doubt that they'll end up with 10,000 employees or who, however many you had. Oh, the, the decimal doesn't matter. Um, it's very important. And employee ownership right now is booming as a way for founders to um, get out of a business and sell it to the employees. It's, it's becoming very widespread. And frankly, to me, that's a, a logical way to uh, push the uh, economic envelope. The Achilles heel in employee ownership is the appraisal. And I can tell you that I can tell you too many horror stories about that, but um, there are ways to beat that. And we just, I, I just think there's huge opportunities there. Yeah. That you might offer to be on the board of directors of of co-op Dayton, Cheryl. How, what 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 are your intersections with um, standard economics or standard grocers? Um, so initially, it was an entire it was a community board. I believe one of the original members of the core team had grocery experience. Their family had run three grocery store uh, chains throughout Dayton, but we brought that in as a part of the pre-development. So two market studies were done, and we also worked with a co-op grocery consulting company called now called Columinate, which now we have a sufficient amount of expertise that we are also consultants with the group and are able to tap into that knowledge when we run into challenges. So our initial general managers, our interim general managers were from Columinate and had 20 plus years of grocery industry experience as they were helping us stand up the store. And I would love to talk more about ESOPs and <laughs> uh, take up Susan's offer of working with you because we, we want to get more into the conversion space for not necessarily employee ownership, but worker ownership, worker co-ops. There's a nonprofit in the Twin Cities that specializes in providing exits for founders of business to convert them to BIPOC ownership in the neighborhoods. It's a... Uh, it, it, it's a developing uh, field. I, I'm not really good at it, Shirelle. I'm, you're talking to an old guy here, so it's a little tricky, but I'm sorry you're not located in St. Cloud, Minnesota, so I could come up and we could hang out together. I see uh, that I'm not sure if it rains or, or Betsy um, talking about co-op activists in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and again, some of the challenges and um, yeah, that some things are, are possible for people who are doing things as a lifestyle choice as opposed to actual viable businesses. And I wanted to say, although it's not directly related to this, but with our, we're finding that with our BIPOC farmers that a lot of the people who come to us who want to learn how to farm or garden are thinking of it less as a, um, less as becoming part of a standard uh, economic system and more to feed themselves and their communities. So I think we're also seeing beyond the, you know, 
beyond it's it's not binary but then there's also like all kinds of um work i think at people becoming self-reliant totally outside of the of the standard economic system uh we have a question from nan or excuse me kathy huff nancy and cheryl how does the new trend during the pandemic of workers who are quitting their jobs who are the low end of wage earners as a source of training and employing new labor for these new businesses of cooperative markets companies and companies that encourage employee ownership that is a really great question kathy because if people are not going to work because it doesn't have meaning and as arthur morgan stated work needs to have meaning and and not being wage slaves most people don't want to be wage slaves anymore so how do we appeal to people who have left the market um, to join cooperative or meaning making enterprises nancy or cheryl or rachel or anyone else on the on the call as well well i would just like to speak up if i may for a moment and say that i think a lot of people simply don't know these kinds of options and it really requires education within the community and so whatever resources are in communities where there can be discussions about developing cooperatives, whether it's for housing or for food or healthcare or whatever. Um, this is the kind of training that needs to be done. And, I, and I'd like to say one other thing, and that is that when we're talking about economy, the most basic aspect of an economy is the food system. How food is grown, uh, how it's produced, how it's distributed and how it's consumed is the absolute core of the society and it permeates all the rest of the institutions of the society and so this transformation that we're seeing with trying to eliminate food deserts having cooperatives of food cooperatives and so forth this is a vital uh process in transforming moving from the old paradigm to a new paradigm you know all of this you know as we've said so much of this thinking isn't isn't necessarily new. We see where Morgan was thinking about these, these things. But what is new is that there is more and more need than ever before for these kinds of institutions to be implemented. And there's more and more need for people to know about them. And that's, I mean, that's one of the key things I see as an educator. That's what my role is, is to try to bring the consciousness that these things exist I'm, I'm not doing them, you know, I'm, I belong to a CSA and a couple of other things, but I'm not doing all of these things. But I want people to know that they are being done and there are people doing them and that they could be doing them too, just as Cheryl is doing and Rachel is doing. You know. so and I'll, I'll it's, add it's that education. It's, it's really hard work. People don't want to change their mindsets. People don't want to bother with a local currency when they can just use a credit card. Right. They want to retain ownership of land so that they can speculate and make money. Like right. you're, you're going against the, the stream and it's, it's hard work, but it's so, so important. Right. But also I think as more people get pushed off the edges of the economy, they're looking for how can I take care of the things that I need to take care of, you know, and that's where things like, you know, food co-ops and so forth are so critical because it presents a different model and one that is community controlled, community owned and community controlled. And that's critical. And that's a very different way of doing the economy around food. Absolutely. Yes, thank you, Nancy. And I, I did want, or sorry, Cheryl, did you want to say something? No? Um, I'll just say real quick, I, I agree that it's education, but also creating pathways for people to put participate in these things without the risk. Um, like we run an incubator program for people to quit their jobs, leave the security uh, of the, the companies that we don't want to work for to start a co-op or to be a part of a co-op is risky. So finding ways for developers to eliminate that as much as possible is another piece. Yes, thank you so much. I, I did, we have about seven more minutes. I wanted to mention that we have among other speakers tomorrow, Regu Ram Das from Matrana Caton. And a reminder that this, these really are not new economics. They're economics you know, of traditional societies, indigenous societies, um, and look forward to, to hearing him talk 
I just wanted to open it up since we just do have a few more minutes and it's been a really incredibly rich day, um, starting from Scott Sanders uh, first in the morning and many of you have been hanging out with us all day. So any any concluding thoughts for the first day of the, of the symposium or conference? You can raise your hand and we can unmute you if you have anything you'd like to share. April, I hate to call on you, but I, since, since we've been talking about this for several months now, what are your thoughts at the end of this first day? Well, I'm super impressed with how everyone tied all their talks into Morgan's legacy. I mean, I knew, I guess I knew that was the goal of what we were trying to do, but in a way, I don't know that I saw all the ways they overlap until today, until all of your presentations and, uh, and so that to me really made it feel like, uh, I mean, like a really tangible legacy for, for Morgan and for us as community activists and organizers. Thanks, April. Any other, any other thoughts? I was interested and I, I know that, or I know from speaking to co-op faculty at Antioch as well as to uh, Miller, Miller faculty that students really love um, being able to be part of the food economy to work on farms and and in general I think there is a real desire for many young people to really get their hands on the soil so I think there's a, a lot of intersection with the conversation this morning on co-op education as well and and uh, for our friends at Arthur Morgan School I know that's a big part of of the um, education at Arthur Morgan School did you want to say something about that Joyce if we could get you unmuted. Um, David, maybe you could unmute Joyce. I'm sorry, I was making notes about what was just said. What was your question? No, I was saying that uh, it seems like young people, and maybe it's always been that way, but that young people today are eager to be figure out how to grow food or just understand more about how food is grown. And I know that Arthur Morgan School has a garden and wondering if, if you have noticed, has that been an increase or have students always been interested in this, the hands-on piece of their education? Oh, this is a very important part of their education. It was what I was hoping to present from uh, former staff, present staff and parents about how important that has been for, for the students and continues to be and will be in the future. So the, the, yes, this is a very important part of what we do at the school and, and has an impact on those students after they leave, which carries through with them, you know, through the rest of their lives. And that's, those are the testimonies and statements that we have received from former students and former staff and present staff. It was in cook too. They learned to cook. And they learned to cook. Oh, and yeah, they learned to cook. important. <laughs> they learned to cook for 40 people. They have to figure out how to get it all done on time. So when they're ready to serve it, they have to figure out how, how it works, <laughs> you know, how to plan. But they also have, uh, have learned about the chemistry of cooking and what it takes to bake a loaf of bread, for example, you know, um, it, it includes, you know, not, not only just the cooking, but the chemistry of it. And, and also they can go out in the garden and pick a carrot out of the ground, realize how that carrot grew. That sounds really beautiful. Joyce, thank you so much for sharing that. Richie, I think you have the last question since we're almost, almost done. <clears throat> Well, it's, um, I had to tune in late because of another meeting, so I missed early part of this, but um, I guess it's a comment more than a question. Maybe it's both. My sense is, um, as, as things go, the, the Morgan legacy is a, <clears throat> these, these seeds get planted and then, um, <clears throat> The, the real work comes back in waves and Community Solutions is now um, 
catching the wind from that second or third or whatever wave that um, is coming through from the Morgan legacy. So the, the time has, uh, seems to me to be ripe for a lot of things to come together 